Thanks for joining us. To the people that are new here, we're pleased to have you for a seminar sponsored by the Center for Democracy and Ecology and the Center for Democracy of Health and Aging. Um, today, we're lucky to have James Carey with us. James is a professor of entomology at UC Davis and also an affiliate of the Center for Economic and demography, well, economics and demography of aging. Economics and demography at UC Berkeley. And um, Dr. Carey comes to us with you know, a fascinating background of study in entomology and animal ecology and population biology. He's probably best known as one of the people that founded and developed biodemography. Um, and his work has encompassed many species of beyond those humans. Uh, and today we get to hear a little bit about this tour through uh, biodemography from his perspective. He has a book coming out at Princeton uh, this year or next? Early next year. Early yeah. next year on this subject. Um, for those of you who are also interested and available tomorrow, Dr. Carey is going to be talking about um, the use of presentation and uh, data visualization. I'll let him talk a little bit yeah, more yeah. about this. Right. Um, but please join me in welcoming this award-winning um, professor. We're delighted to have him here to join us to talk about the subject. Okay. What a great <coughs> introduction. Um, so uh, I grew up in the Midwest. It's just fantastic. I've talked to a number of people here and I said if, if I'd ended up in Wisconsin, I would have, uh, at University of Wisconsin, I would have said I, I died and gone to heaven. It's just a wonderful campus here and a wonderful reputation. I'm so uh, privileged to uh, be invited here, so thank you. Um, look, the... Um, so, I'm going to talk about biodemography, and I titled it a 21st Century Guided Tour, What Can You Do in 50 Minutes or an Hour, of course. But uh, here's where, uh, look, let me put, first off, biodemography into uh, a global context. Just so we, we have demography, which is the study of population and the, po and the processes that shape it, birth, death, and migration. And biodemography we'll put into context as well. So if you look at all of sort of the layers here from atomic, molecular, all the way down to planetary and beyond, I view it's that demography is really, uh, it's what I call the skin in, uh, skin out. You have skin uh, in, which is the zoology, uh, uh, biology and so forth, and skin out would be individual uh, outward and so forth. So that's the domain domain of demography. When you expand a biodemography, it's basically putting humans, and by the way, I mean demography as you know, I'm at the demography center here, that has studied primarily humans, but in fact, you put humans into a, a, the context of the tree of life, and that's where we come in with biodemography, and so that all uh, animals, plants, have population, individuals, and so forth, so that we're taking these same basic principles and applying them and deriving new ones from, uh, you know, biology writ large. So that's the uh, context for this. So look, here's my talk, and that is I've divided it into three main parts. We have concepts and models, so I'm not going, uh, Jenna mentioned my book, but uh, I'm not going, it's a methods and concepts book, and so what I talk about here is primarily some of the, I guess, concepts and the, and the results, that sort of thing. And then, because this is uh, interested in humans, I assume you're, uh, many people here are interested in humans, I have a section here on human evolutionary demography. I'm developing some ideas there that I'll get into and uh, cover that. And then the third main part would be demographic controversy. So I talk about that. I've been on a uh, loop of an email with about 50 individuals. It's about one, this one is about the, uh, whether the, the authenticity of this Madame Gilmont, the oldest person ever to live, huge, and so there's a Russian scientist that uh, says, no, it's all a fraud. So anyway, I touch on that and a couple others. So that's where I'm headed here. So anyway, that's a mock-up of the cover of the book. Anyway, I'm gonna talk about that just very briefly at the very end. So look, within the concepts and models, I talk about uh, these different parts, lifespan, mortality, reproduction, health, and population. So let me start off with lifespan. Look, this looks like a, Minnesota, or a Wisconsin uh, northern uh, lake, right? Every one of these uh, has a lifespan, okay? And so you have here would be patrolling dragonflies. These live uh, two to four months or so. You'd have, what, swarming mayflies. This is some of the shortest lived in, uh, animals. This is the adults anyway. And that would be 24 to 48 hours or so. You'd have this giant water bug. They actually live a very long time, one or two years. You'd have fireflies, maybe three to four weeks. Every one of these, every one of these have a lifespan that's evolved. I say it's like a polar bear with a white fur 
and uh, giraffes with a long neck, of course these evolved. Lifespans also evolved, they're evolved traits. And so that, uh, that's part of the suite of these interconnecting life history traits. So all of it has to fit together neatly. The reproduction, the be you know, everything fits together of which lifespan is part of that life history uh, concept. And so that just as a quick survey here, uh, I'll go through some lifespans. This is insects and arthropods. And so I already mentioned the mayflies, maybe two days or so. I'm sure you have hatches, huge hatches here probably at, uh, in your lake. And uh, moths, maybe a couple of weeks, mites, uh, 30 days or so, fruit flies, I'll just go through these, grasshoppers, six months. Some of these big dragonflies can live a year or so, this would be tropical and, uh, and temperate like this, they die in the winter or the fall. Uh, wasp, maybe a year and a half, ground beetle, a couple of years, uh, these, uh, this one, uh, serious uh, ve disease, vector regivids. Rhinoceros beetle, four years. Honey bees, you get into social insects, they live a, a very long time, I'll talk about that in just a bit. A tarantula, maybe 10 years or so, and you get up in termite queens that would live uh, several decades, it's unbelievable. Then we have, so in other words, this is a 5,000 fold difference, okay? 5,000 fold difference in lifespans of insects, okay? Plant lifespans, you have short-lived, just move on up the uh, scale here and uh, some of these poppy, peach, 10 years, and you get into some of these uh, trees that live unbelievable, uh, baobab, uh, uh, you know, several thousand years. This has been in the, uh, just in the New York Times, I saw an article on that. Uh, anyway, up to maybe 5,000 years, and of course the redwood, 4,000, you get a bristol cone pine, 5,000 or so. So we're talking about 15,000 fold. Okay, and with avians, you get into birds, hummingbirds. Birds, by the way, are for their size, are very long lived relative to mammals. So, like a hummingbird or a canary, it's the size of a mouse or rat. Mouse or rat would live uh, a year or two or three, and uh, these things live eight and ten years. Uh, birds, in general, are much longer lived, okay, for their size. Pheasant, goose, Condor, seagull, we'll just go on up here. And so these hornbills are fascinating. You get into these gray parrots, I'm sure you've all read about that, maybe 70 or 80 years, it's unbelievable. You buy a parrot, you have this for literally a lifetime. But uh, so anyway, we're talking about uh, tenfold. Mammalian, I'll, fin I'll finish off with this. A mouse, a couple years or so. And uh, so we go on, by the way, seals are really long lived for their size. And the, what, where I'm headed here is that Okay, this is interesting, sort of an overview, but the more interesting questions are why it evolved the way they did. That's where I'm headed here. And so rhinoceros, 50 years, gorillas, so these are great apes here, 60 years, elephants, 70 years, and so forth, okay? These orcas, maybe the females anyway, up to 90 years they estimate. And you get into humans, and so that's not the max, but nonetheless we're talking about ballpark of a century or so. Humans are actually very long-lived mammals for our size. If we lived just according to size, we live about 20 or 30 years, about like a white-tailed deer, about 150, 200 pounds right in there. But look, then we get into this. They discovered this uh, a number of years ago that the bowhead whale, they did some uh, estimates on that from the eye uh, sections and uh, also a harpoon that they, you know, hadn't been around for many years. They estimate that lives up to 250 years. Every one of these, whether it's these mammals or the insects, all the way back a few slides, it's a question of why did they evolve this lifespan? It all has to fit together, okay? And so we're talking about 125 fold. But anyway, there's humans. We're actually very long lived relative to the majority, but there's at least one. It's probably more than that, but at least one they found that lived very much longer, okay? So here's the uh, question though, what I find more interesting questions, and that is, what factors favor the evolution of lifespan extremes, okay? So why do we get, uh, fi you know, several thousand fold difference in evolved lifespans, okay? And so that here's a lifespan evolution, it's what I call the phylogenetic floor plan, okay? It's called a bow plan of, uh, for the biologists, they uh, call it, the, it's basically the floor plan. And basically you start out, that's a starting point, is that you have long-lived groups and short-lived groups. It's built into the design for being long-lived or short-lived, okay? So in this case, beetles are the turtles of the uh, insect world. They're built to be long-lived. So that they, as uh, pre-adults, larvae, they uh, use most of the resources to uh, produce cuticles, so they have 
you know, their shells or whatever. And then when they emerge as adults or reclose as adults, uh, they have to go feed, find food. So they have chewing mouth parts. They must live a long time because they have to acquire the protein to produce eggs and so on and so forth. Whereas by design, butterflies are shorter lived. And so that uh, they put most of the resources into uh, eggs. So that when they emerge as, caterp as uh, butterflies or moths, they're ready to lay eggs. They don't have to go find the protein and take the time to produce eggs. So by design, these are shorter lived and these are longer lived. Now you can have variation within each one of these, of course, but nonetheless, that's a starting point is this floor plan. So with the beetles, you'd have cuticle, you'd have chewing mouth parts, parts that are longer lived, butterflies, fragile wings, sucking proboscis so they can just go get some nectar and so forth and they're pre ovogenic that is they already have their eggs and you can get uh, you know butterflies that may live a year some species but you're not going to get 10 and 15 year butterflies but you can get long-lived beetles maybe three to five years or so okay then the next level you have that within these in this case the beetles you can have shorter lived and longer lived and that's where the evolutionary ecology modifies the lifespan within uh, these phylogenetic constraints. So if some species go to the desert, there's different lifespan adaptations for that environment versus the tropics versus any number of other environments. And so, uh, so anyway, that's the next level. Now, the longevity extremes. Not everything falls into these categories I'm going to show, but this is, uh, it's stood up for 20 years or so since I developed this uh, pretty well. And I have the first level is an environmentally selected. And I use this Na uh, Nabib beetle. It's uh, found in the Namibia, but uh, in the desert. But uh, they, that's a fog harvesting uh, beetles or whatever. But they're in uncertain environments. I always say that the 100 year flood, not that they're having it there, is a good thing or the, every 10 or 20 years or whatnot. Uh, because it's the only time conditions are uh, uh, satisfactory for a reproduction. The other, they can survive through and so forth, but they need good conditions every whatever. That's the uncertainty part before they can reproduce. And so that any individuals that don't make it through that uncertain period, whether it's 10 years or 30 or whatever, it's just direct Darwinian selection. They're going to be selected out, and it's only the longer-lived ones that make it. Okay? That's one category here of the uncertain environment. The other one would be low resource. I call it the bullion cube in the swimming pool, is that the... Resources are there, but they're really dilute, and it takes forever for uh, animals to acquire the resources to grow and, and then also to reproduce. So these deep sea species, uh, deep sea like tube tubes and uh, cave species and so forth would fall into that category. So you get some of the longest lived individuals, not just insects, this is generalized to you know, rep desert reptiles or whatever too. Uh, so that's one category. Another category is this, what, we, what I call socially selected, and that is long life, sorry, short life and sociality are inconsistent. You can't have short lived and sociality. It takes a while to develop these relationships and the divisional labor and all that business that goes with sociality. And so you're selecting for very long life, in particular in the queens of termites and ants, <clears throat> and to a certain extent, a wasp and uh, a bees. But that's where these things can live 25 and 30 years. They're the ovary of the superorganism, and so it's very long-lived. And then a third category is what I call uh, reproductively constrained. And so that this is a tsetse fly. They would produce one offspring, they lar what they call larva posit. That is, just pr have blood meals. They produce the larvae, the maggot, in their abdomen, then, and then they just deposit that uh, larvae, as a, which pupates right away. They live a very long time. But there's uh, many other species, even the seals, for example. This would be one explanation for them, is that you have about a six-week period where you have uh, conditions where they have to produce their pups, grow them, and so forth. If, if they produce two, they dilute the, uh, you know, the resources, both of them die. You've got to put all the resources into one. And so, but to have uh, you know, a, a, a sure um, replacement, you have uh, live a long time, so you have many uh, chances to produce those. Bats would be another one. They produce one, most of them anyway, produce one offspring. You can't be flying around with a big litter 
and still dart around and find get your moths and that sort of to get your uh, prey and so forth. So anyway, those are the uh, extremes right in there. What the factors that favor extreme longevity in general. Okay. Now for social species, there's a famous uh, wasp biologist Howard Evans that uh, developed this. Uh, the evolution of sociality in wasps, but there, there, he had 13 different uh, stages of, uh, <clears throat> of the evolution from a uh, parasitoid to the full uh, eusociality. I collapsed them down to four. And so this is the coevolution of sociality. So you ask the question, which came first? I think this applies to humans as well. But anyway, which came first, so to speak, the sociality or the longevity? Okay, what set? What was a pre-adaptation for the other? So here's how it works, and that is where you have these four different stages, and I'll walk through these. So you start out with the solitary parasitoid. That's these little wasps not social at all, they're just parasitoids. And the host is basically a living incubator, so they lay their egg in the host, the host uh, goes about its business, and then eventually the, uh, that egg becomes a larvae and it eats the host and so forth. But there's no nest, and the, so therefore there's no parental care. So that, anyway, that's a starting point. The next uh, series of stages you get to would be this mass provisioning, where you have a nest, so it starts out in the most primitive stage. It would be they just tuck the host under some, uh, you know, detritus or whatever, kind of a, a pre-nest concept. But anyway, eventually they begin building nests. And um, what uh, mass provisioning would be that they get their host, put them in this nest to this chamber right in here, and then lay their egg on it, and then they fly, seal the nest and fly away and die, and then the next year the offspring uh, emerge. But anyway, the nest becomes the nexus. So now you have protection for not just the host, but also the mother can, uh, you know, reside there, and there's a level of protection from that. They end up being longer lived, and you can produce fewer offspring because you have higher survival. And uh, there's, but there's no generation overlap. That's the key. Now, when I was reading through this paper of he Evans, there was a stage where this is it. And that is where you have progressive provisioning. So that first you have a longevity extens extension, and that is where the wasp is not mass provisioning, they come back like birds. This would be birds do progressive provisioning, that is, as needed provisioning. <clears throat> so that they go out and forage, they come back and they feed their offspring with little, you know, little masticated uh, bits of food. And by the way, they lay their eggs first in the chamber. It's not like after the food's there. So they lay their eggs and then they start feeding them, okay? But anyway, daughters as helpers, and this is the key, is that you have extended longevity set this evolutionary stage. And that is where the mothers were still alive when the daughters uh, begin to emerge. So now you have the conditions for uh, incipient sociality to emerge, okay? And so that's the incipient sociality, right? So that the key development here is that the longevity of the mother is extended to overlap with the daughters, thus creating this incipient sociality. And now the daughters can go forage, take care of the nest and so forth, and the mother can be, be fed by the daughters but also be producing eggs. So now it's the first level of sociality. Okay, and then the next uh, one, next series of stages, you'd have the mother becomes the main reproductive. And so that she's very long lived, she becomes the ovary for this super organism now. And the workers are short lived, so they're disposable basically. And uh, anyway, divisional labor and very low pre adult mortality. Anybody, a hornet's nest or whatnot, those are like really defended fiercely. Okay. So the bottom line here is that longevity extension and social complexity are mutually reinforcing. You have longevity extension, which sets the stage for greater social complexity, but then this greater social complexity then sets the stage for greater longevity. Okay? So that's how that works. So that's the lifespan. Next uh, part, mortality. Most of you, are, uh, many of you are demographers, and so you know this, but just so everybody's on the same page here, is that age-specific mortality, anybody done life table, 
you can derive one parameter from the other basically. <clears throat> but there's one parameter that's the, the most important and it's age specific mortality. And it's because it's risk. Risk uh, uh, underlies everything. So it's the probability of an individual alive at, you know, this year, at age X, will die before the next year, okay? Now, I say mortality drives the life table. Survival is subject to mortality risk. Life expectancy is, you have a life expectancy, or people do, subject to that mortality risk from uh, that year forward. Uh, death distribution subject. So everything comes back to mortality risk. It's one of the uh, most important parameters, as I've said, <clears throat> to, to uh, study. Okay, now, here is a survival curve of humans. So this is what the uh, demographers here know, this is the LX schedule. And uh, anyway, survivors shift from birth and that's the trajectory of a modern uh, life table, okay? Now, there is the mortality curve. This is a schematic, not to scale, to get the idea here. And so you have the probability of dying from one year to the next on this axis and you have the age here, all right? And so we start out with, uh, typically it's higher, the infant mortality for the first year is higher, typically, than uh, subsequent years until you get to the older ages. So let's just say it's one out of 500. This is modern uh, 2010 rates somewhere in there for females, okay? Then you have, this is the lowest of the life course. It's around 10, 11, 12 years old right in there. One out of 8,000, it's unbelievable. Uh, little, at least 11 year old girls don't die. I mean, it's very, very rare. One uh, Boys too, that's not quite that low, but nonetheless it's very low. So that's a, basically a universal two, is that you go to any place in the world and generally, you can scale this up and down, but generally the shape is roughly the same right in there. So that's the lowest point. So that may be one out of 8,000. Now you walk up to uh, say uh, age 80, uh, 50, one out of 400, still pretty low. Uh, I guess I jumped all the way up to there, and then you get out of one, of, one out of two. <clears throat> and so it's 50%. I'm gonna come back to this leveling up. This is one of the controversies right in there. I'll, I'll talk about that later. But look, you get some idea what it takes, if it's one out of two, rough give or take at 100, to make it to 110, it's like taking uh, 10 coins, throwing them on the desk here, and they all come up heads. That's the probability, it's very, very low. And uh, so anyway, that's the shape of the mortality and there's a huge amount of information in a curve like that that you don't see from all the other schedules. Survivorship was that one of them, okay? Now, here is the section that uh, is called the Gompertz model. So that's the exponential rate of uh, aging right in there. It's generally 8% per year. Although I presented this to, in Denmark with Jim Bopel and he said, no, that's wrong, but I don't get it. I think it's 8%. But in any case, the, you know, clear it's, uh, you know, down and up right in here for the early uh, developmental stages and to age 30 or so. And then up here, this is where the, some of the controversy comes in, where it begins slowing. But in general, this is one of the most important, maybe the most important model in all of demography. It's certainly actuarial part of demography. And that's the Gompertz model. I tell my students, you know, the good news is when you turn age 30 um, <coughs> that you gain 8%. The bad news is it's a mortality risk every year. And uh, anyway, there, there that is, okay? Now, it's not possible to understand the actuarial properties of, in this case, insect cohorts and populations without understanding age-specific mortality. And so that we use this to study uh, aging, okay? Now, so the, the question that actually put uh, our project on the map, this is 25 years ago or so, to get started. I was working with James Vapel, which I, I, I assume a lot, at least the demographers know him by reputation. And, um, and this was back when the oldest old, 85 and beyond. This is back in the uh, mid, uh, sorry, the late 80s or so. And so the question was, and James Fries, I quote him right here, he's a rheumatologist at Stanford, and uh, basically it's a length of life is fixed, okay? And uh, do I have the quote from Encyclopedia there? No, not quite. 
And, but anyway, there's another quote. We can get them all over the place. There's one in Encyclopedia Britannica. Not that that's the scientific source, but it's written by, you know, advised by scientists. It's like there's an age to which people can live, but nobody can live beyond. There's, of course, zero evidence for that. Zero. Okay. And so where I'm headed here, though, too, is that uh, raise your hand if you don't think that you can live forever. Of course not. You know, but raise your hand if you think there's a single age to which people can reach and then nobody can live beyond, no matter what you do. You know, I'm not actually literally asking you to raise your hand, but that's the point. And so that anyway, so we challenge this. And so the uh, idea here is that if that is fixed, then you should have an age literally to which people can survive to or name your species, in this case flies. And no matter what you do, you can't change that. There is like a time bomb. And so that there should be a wall of death here, okay? Now you can actually test that with, if you have enough insects, which we did. <laughs> so anyway, I was working, uh, had a student who, um, I've always been in, demo I've just been fascinated by demography by, from day one when I got into science basically entomology but you have to pay the bill somehow and so you do it other ways any way you can but I was working with a student who uh, was a direct not a student at the time but he was director of this factory right here this in Tapachula Mexico uh, you can just look over there and there's Guatemala it's right on the border USDA and Mexico built this to uh, for medfly production to prevent the spread they sterilize them and so it doesn't work but that's a detail here but anyway um, but anyway, they raise a billion flies. That's five tons of flies a week, five tons. And so we had, okay, you can make some uh, major life tables from that. And so uh, that's kind of what we did. And uh, that really, Vapel started uh, like uh, salivating over that when he heard that. But uh, anyway, it was sort of the planets were aligned right and we all got together, you know. It's just one of those scientific things that happens once in a while. But anyway, so we did a study with uh, this many. We had 1.2 million flies. And the reason you need numbers, I uh, talk about that in just a bit. But, uh, you know, the very thing you're measuring is the deaths. Well, the trouble is you run out of flies. And so I always say if you have, uh, you know, 100 mice, and you want to look at the last 10% uh, that live, now you have 10 mice. That's really, the that's nothing, okay? Now you have a, m a million mice, and you have 10% left, you have 100,000. Those are major numbers to ask the question about what's the trajectory, that's where we're headed with mortality, okay? So that this was a study that came out in Science uh, back in 92. I left that whole page, at, that's when Iceman, it was the same issue as Iceman. <laughs> and I go, God, that's a... Maybe that's going to overshadow everything of ours, but it, anyway, it didn't. But anyway, it's a slowing mortality at the older ages, so we had that. So look, here's the uh, mortality, and that's why mortality is so important. We're not interested in how long they live per se. We're interested in the trajectory. And so that we had, uh, what do we have? So this is mortality right in here, and this is age. Now, when you look at this, if we had small numbers, we'd say, well, it's obvious that it's just going straight up in the study, okay? Uh, but we still had 300,000 alive right in there, okay? Now, uh, so, then it started leveling off, and in fact, clear at the end, it started to decrease. But so here's what you have. You had the rapid increase of this, and then you had a shoulder, which is a little bit of a detail, but it's actually real. It's pretty interesting. And then you had a peak and you had a decline. But the main part here was really, it was slowing. That's the carryaway uh, for this talk, but also for our paper. And so it wasn't just a wall of, I mean, it was not a wall of death. So we can demonstrate that, no, it doesn't just continue to go up at the oldest ages. And so the main findings was that it slows at older ages, no wall of death. It's what I call indeterminate. And so the lifespan, um, is, it's like with indeterminate and determinate growth or egg laying comes from uh, bird studies or whatnot. If you have um, albatross lays one egg, right? That's a determinate egg layer. Chickens lay whatever, but they're indeterminate. But they don't lay an infinite number. They lay a lot, but it's not one number. It's the same thing with lifespan, is that I call it indeterminate. You can never put one number on it and say that's the number that's the age to which people can live, but nobody can live beyond. Okay.
So anyway, why we needed 1.2 million flies? I like this uh, metaphor Pell developed, and that is it's like the Hubble telescope of the actuarial world. You can peer into the far reaches of the uh, actuarial universe, you know, when you have big numbers. The thing is, if you have small numbers, you know, it's mortality, so that it's going to bounce around. Small numbers, what can you do with that, you know? That would be 100 flies. Now you have 1,000. You still kind of a straight line, but you run out of flies. So you get messy. Anyway, you keep going here. You get 100,000. Now you can, you're can you getting someplace where you can uh, make um, more definitive statements about the true trajectory. That's why you need a lot of flies. You could never do this with small numbers. You could never do this with mice. You'd never get up to a million mice. Okay. This just came out, of, uh, what, last year or so. Here's a plateau. Again, this is controversial, but in any case, this is 105-year-old Itali Italian women. And so that uh, Vapel Elisabetta Barbie at, uh, in Italy uh, got the data. She's the lead author here. But anyway, there's the mortality. Here's the age starting at 105. You see the flat that, that is a, uh, basically uh, age-independent mortality at the oldest ages for these. The problem with a study like this is these are cross-sectional and they're not longitudinal studies, okay? One of the problems. Okay, I'm going to burn through this because I uh, want to get through all this. We combined, uh, you look at combined sexes, and so there was our original curve here, but you disaggregate it, and you get really interesting um, patterns here. You get a crossover. Demographers know this is really interesting for the black-white crossover. But in fact, why would males continue to age here? Because it's continuing to go up, but females start to level off and so forth. A lot of interesting questions there. I'm just going to go through this because I, I want to get through my uh, whole talk here. What we ended up with, with that crossover, is what we called a male-female more, more longevity paradox, is that the males are the, uh, have the highest life expectancy, but the females are the last to die. And so that that's what happens when you get this kind of dynamic, okay, with mortality, okay? Follow-up sex, Here's uh, one right in here, look at that, okay? If you change the diet, so that I said, um, you know, I can generate just about any mortality curve that you'd like by manipulating the environment, and you can kind of do it. And that is, if you just feed them, these are big numbers too, not a million, but 100,000. Look at that, you get females, and then males right in here, and so that there it is, you get the crossover with, with a diet, a sugar diet only, okay? Then you go to full diet, which is protein included, then you still get a crossover, but now the males are higher and the females lower. And then you sterilize them, and now you don't get any crossover at all, okay? So that it's really plastic, uh, the mortality trajectory. This, I think, applies to humans as well. It's this controversy that I'll talk about uh, at the end here. Okay, main result, sex mortality differentials are age and context specific, okay, not just age specific, context specific, and it's the female mortality, the response that drives the sex mortality, is that you actually find the males kind of, and the females are bouncing around, so if, if I wanted to spend more time on that, you're going to see the males are fixed and it's the females that really are uh, affected most by the changes in the environment. How do you sterilize 100,000 flies? No, it's with uh, <coughs> cobalt-60 radiation. That's what they do is sterilize them and release them, yeah. Put, put the pupae in big bags and put them through this uh, cobalt-60, yeah. So, uh, okay. So, look, let me keep going here. Reproduction. I'll go through this. Is that the way we, we went from putting, uh, you know, several thousand in a cage, so the group cages, to holding them individually. Again, the demographers know this. It's individual level data. Just that's where it's at, and so that we're measuring individual level fly reproduction. <clears throat> so that you have here, if this is a fly life course, and you measure reproduction, the first day you may have zero. Where I'm headed here is a color code them, and then we're going to bring it all together into a graphic. And then maybe the second day, no eggs. So they have a pre-reproductive period. And then they start laying a few eggs. Uh, you know, one to fifty, one to fifty. Uh, then a lot of eggs, and so you can color code these in different ways. Now, you have that life course, the reproduction, or event, could be blood pressure, it could be heart rate, whatever event you want, within that age group and individuals. Now you take a thousand of these, you color code all of these, and then you get a graphic like this, okay? By the way, you can do this on Excel with conditional formatting. If anybody's interested, come to my talk tomorrow. I'll show you, but in any case, this is a thousand lines, 
a thousand individuals all color coded. So you see the pattern there, the medfly, a different species right in here, and this would be Drosophila. So look at this right in here, and then you can see just a, a slice of, you know, of, of the reproduction here over age and uh, individuals, and you can see immediately that there's different ecologies here, different reproductive patterns, and uh, so forth. These are great diagnostic tools. You pick up nuance that you don't if you just crunch the numbers, okay? And so that uh, also, we did one, I'm gonna get through here. This is a uh, uh, thanatological age, if you know that or not, but it's time to death, okay? So if we look at this, this would be chronological age right in here, the pre-reproductive period, the high reproduction grades off here. This is the death. Now let's normalize them on the right. And so that now you have time to death. And so we're going to let, there's thanatological age. And now we have this edge normalized over here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but we're interested in this. And that is, the question is, <clears throat> what do uh, individuals uh, before uh, they die have in common, whether they die at 10 days old or 90 days old, okay? And you can see here that the ones that live the longest, this is time to death, so they're all 20 days from death here, okay? A little bit different pattern, but if you just look at the slice right through here, there's actually a lot, there's quite a bit in common here. We're trying to, uh, there's about three main patterns. One's a decrease, one's a crash, and one's just zero. Okay, but anyway, we're just in the middle of this looking at the end of life uh, patterns. It's really, really pretty interesting. Okay, there it is right in there. Okay, health. In ecology, health, uh, they haven't done much with it. There's some in conservation biology because you get turtles tangled up in nets and that plastic and whale uh, stomachs and that sort of thing. But in general, there's not as much and they have a huge amount to learn if there's any ecologists here from uh, human demography. So we, we do, I go to Africa a lot. There's an injured dove. Here's a, uh, a baboon. This limp started back here. I didn't get it. I didn't pull my camera out in time. Here's wild dogs. By the way, these are very rare. We ran across these. And here's one here that has serious problems. And then you get these uh, African buffalo. And so we were trying to, when you go, if you go on safari, start looking for this, you know, the injured. There's really one that's in bad shape, okay? So that health in uh, ecology, there's a huge uh, amount of work there to be done. It's really uh, has, has great potential. So, but in any case, back to insects, as we found a health uh, concept, uh, discovered one in our medflies, my colleagues did in Greece. And here is the deal. And that is where you have, this is live, medfly, that's what it looks like. There's supine, okay? They end up on their backs, sort of in a, what I call a, uh, it looked like a tonic immobility. I didn't know it at the time, but it's kind of like that. They're just catatonic on their backs. Most people, which including us, thought they were dead. You sweep them out and count them as dead, but in fact, they're just kind of under, have a paralysis for a while, and then they recover, and there's a real dead one. And so there is the pattern. Here again is this event history uh, patterns right in here. And you can see this is uh, really serious in here. It's sort of onset here and there's none here of the supine uh, behavior. And you can see this is time to death specific and not age specific, okay? And you can also see in general, once you see a sign of that, they've got about two weeks left. And so it's predictive. I'm just going to go through this right in here. We only had 1% pre-supine that died. Most of them ended up displaying some level of that. And you have here, basically it's universal, it's progressive, so it gets worse, and it's predictive, so you can say, well, two weeks, give or take, they're dead, and it's irreversible. We didn't see any recover. And the <coughs> advantage of that is that then, uh, that is having a model like that, you can get into the active versus uh, total life expectancy. Again, the demographers here know all about this. But you have here the active life expectancy, that is before disability, and <coughs> onset of chronic disease, and then the total life expectancy, and you can start studying the compression of morbidity. And that is that as you extend life expectancy, uh, does this stay fixed and you're simply increasing the uh, uh, prevalence of, uh, of the uh, you know, uh, lower quality life days and so forth. So anyway, it turns out that nearly one in five days was spent in this unhealthy stage. You have gradients and monitor health and yeah, anyway, that sets the stage for starting to look for health 
uh, you know, I always think the health, uh, the morbidity schedule in nature is the most important one. Once a bird has a problem, well, if it has a foot problem, it can still fly. If it has a wing problem, it's basically dead. It's just a detail that kills it, okay? There's uh, the carryaway right in there, so, okay. Cut back on the crap, okay. Last uh, of this section, I'll get through this. So look, here is one of the big problems one of the non-problems in human demography is data. And you have birth dates, you have death dates, and I know you can get into remote tribes and you have problems, but in general you have data. In non-human populations, huge problem. You can count numbers, even that's a challenge many times. Age, are you kidding me? Huge challenge. So when we got money to do aging in the wild, we had NIH funding for this, <coughs> I said, Okay, instead of the mark recapture business and uh, there's even aging methods and so forth, which are just so crude, and mark recapture is like, let's release 100,000 and we'll get uh, 10 back, okay. Oh, let's double the efficiency, now you get 20 back. You know, I mean, this is nothing. And so we, came, we tried to come up with a different concept, ask a different question about aging in the wild. So here's the deal. What if you have a uh, birth right in here or emergence of a medfly and it does its business out in the wild and you have no clue what it's doing, but then you capture it, okay? And then you can monitor this segment of the life, uh, individual life course, okay? But you don't know what does this capture segment. Now we do this for 100 flies or 1,000 flies or whatever. And that's all the information we have. We don't know whether we caught it right after it was born or it closed or uh, the day before it's going to die, basically. We have no clue. So the question is, what can you do with those data? Okay. So uh, <clears throat> I talked to my really, well, Jim Bapel, but there's a lot of mathematicians in mathematical demography, as you might imagine. And, well, with Bayesian uh, statistics, I think we can work this out, but it's going to take several months, blah, blah, blah. Turns out, that there's a um, simple solution uh, for certain assumptions, a stationary population, okay? And so I don't have to talk about, I've already talked about that uh, in a way. You can have this segment that lives one day, but it was born clear back here. This one also lives, this is the black box right in here. That's the point. And so the question is, what can you do with that information, okay? So how do you determine age structure of a stationary population without knowing the age of a single individual within it, okay? How do you do it, okay? <clears throat> Here's the deal. Pretend all these are, pick your animal here, mice, insects, or whatever, and you have a population here, and you're gonna sample them, and uh, you have no clue what their ages are, okay? But let's cheat. Let's say we're gonna take a peek, and we know all the ages, so these are color-coded age. All right. Now we go through, collect them, or mark them, and now we're going to monitor them from uh, of all these mixed ages from the point of our capture to or marking to death. Okay. So here we have. So we have in our black box right in here, or our marked individuals, we have this is the number of individuals in each of those age categories from that stationary population. So we have 40, 30, 25, and 5. Okay? Now we're going to uh, survive them forward and we're going to count the number of deaths. Okay? Anybody know this story? You do? Yeah. <coughs> anyway, here's the post capture deaths. So that every one of those back here, you're going to die whether you're zero years old or whatever to three years old. Some are going to die, okay? And all those are going to stack up right in here. So we take those that die and put them in this category right in here of the time zero, okay? Then you do this, you keep doing this, and now they all die. Okay, look at that. You have 40, 30, and so forth. This is the death distribution is exactly equal to the uh, original age distribution. Vapel, uh, I discovered this. And it was just, uh, not mathematically, I just did, played around, gnawed at it until it's kind of like there's got to be a mathematical, statistical relationship here. And there was. They called it uh, Carey's equality. 
And so the death distribution randomly captured individuals of unknown age in the stationary population reveals its age structure, okay? Property number one, that's what I just stated. And then property number two, although they're really interconnected. And the proportion of individuals X days old in a population is equal to the proportion of X days to live, okay? And so that here would be a population you'd have this fraction that are exactly 90 to 95 days old. This would be in their stationary population. This equals the fraction that still have 90 to 95 years yet to live, okay? That's the equivalency of this uh, equality that I discovered. And then, but I'm gonna get through this fast, that's the exact equality, okay? And so that's what Bell, life lived and left, carries equality. There's then uh, Nicholas Bruard, it turns out, had discovered this 10 years ago, but it was buried in a Cameroon handbook of population, but anyway. So, um, but anyway, that's another story. Let me just touch on the main points here. Remember the wasp story, is that this evolved, so that now you have a nest, and you have long-lived, and these are fiercely defended. My, uh, I've thought about this a long time, but just recently I've really begun to develop it. And that is <clears throat> that all great apes make nests <clears throat> and they re sleep in a recumbent position, that is on their side, on their back or whatever. Monkeys roost. Great apes sleep in a recumbent position. We're evolved from ancestors of great apes so that there's no reason to believe Australopithecus and earlier versions of hominids and so forth didn't sleep just like that and also built nests, okay? And so that the nest now we've all heard about caves and community and so forth. Of course, that's important. But I think the, one of the key evolutionary um, developments uh, was this nest. And so that now you have, this is actually a picture we took. We went on a Botwa bot Pygmy uh, tour. And so now you have this hut. So the nest becomes a proto hut becomes a hut becomes a house and so forth and this is really really critical to the evolution of humans in my view they had to have huts you have australopithecus range but homo erectus here's the range this is it's in the literature where the humans can't survive if you don't have shelter below if you in an environment 57 degrees or uh, below and that australopithecus made it all through here they had to they were up here as well they had to have have huts this there's not enough caves for everybody for that matter you can't heat a whole cave you have to have a hut to heat once you get a hut because i'm going to skip over some stuff here once you get a hut then uh you have a proto family and with uh with um, great apes they just produce one and then they kick it out, and then they have another one. And then they kick it out, and they have another. There's no overlap. Humans are the, the uh, primate where you have a brood. That is, it's evolved a family. So I can see in the early stages, you had, you know, there's no trees for Junior to go to to build his own nest. And so that he sticks around a little bit longer while the next one comes. You can see where I'm headed here, and pretty soon you have the overlap. And also, once you have a hut, I call it the first sleepover. So that males, is like, why am I guarding out here? It's like, let me just go in and sleep with, uh, you know. And uh, so that now you have uh, the, um, what do they call it, uh, clandestine sex and the intimacy and so on and so forth. There's a lot of things that flow from this nest concept. Everything from the family evolution to the, uh, to the pair bonding and, and uh, so on and so forth that, uh, that I'm really developing. There's the evolution. I'm going to burn through this fairly fast here. But you have different stages. What I wanted to say, that you started out with apes. They just have really three, two stages, the ju uh, juvenile and, uh, and the uh, uh, infant and juvenile. And then we have childhood and we have adolescent. These stages evolved, in my view. <clears throat> Part of the arguments has been, well, you don't want to teach somebody that's as tall as you are and so forth. I think it has more to do with the workforce. And so that's where I'm, yeah. So here is the um, uh, great apes, one, kick out, one, one, one. Here you have our overlap in humans. Where I wanted to go here was this. And that is that there's an emerging literature in the anthropology uh, literature <coughs> where it has um, that really it's child labor, okay? 
any farm family knows this, but anybody that has a mom and pop store knows it too. Everybody's into this. You know, you've got to pull your own weight. And certainly prehistoric humans, they had to. And so that you have uh, different levels of, uh, these are tasks. So you have a low skill, low strength. Kids can go out and collect shellfish and get little, uh, you know, fish and so forth, collect firewood. They can uh, offset. It's not just a cost. They're not out there just hanging out, playing. They can produce, uh, c contribute back to the family. You have a low skill, high strength. You can carry wood. Anybody who's been to Africa or probably South, you see this. Then you have uh, high skill, low strength, like making arrows or spears. And then, of course, high strength, high skill, that sort of thing. Okay. But the, uh, so here's the net contributions. This would be here. Uh, that is the cost, basically, of a kid. A newborn is costly, but by their two or three, they're even more costly. But then they start sort of paying back. So this is all the way to uh, 15 or 18 or whatnot. Now you bring all this together, and so now you have kids, but there's the workforce for the family, and that this is the net value. So the, anybody that's had kids kind of knows this, you know. The first one's tough, the second one's tough, but pretty soon they're growing up and they can kind of pay back. That's the whole thing right in here, okay? And that's par part of the, um, you know, the ev evolutionary ecology of the, of the uh, family. But here's some controversies. And the biggest one is one I mentioned right up front. And that is the age of the oldest person, this Madame Calmont, 122 years, 164 days. And so that my colleagues, in fact, I was alive when she was still alive. We were putting bets on when, how long she'd live, you know. But uh, in 1997, uh, she died, okay. And that Jim Vapel and Bernard Jean and Denmark and uh, 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 Robin, Jean-Marie Robin, French demographer, they all vetted this. You would know all of them, yeah. And, uh, and you probably too. But uh, anyway, so that they vetted this and said it's a real deal. This Russian comes along. He's a PhD student. This is just a couple, three months ago or several months ago. And uh, says it's all a fraud, okay? Evidence that she died in 1934. And so this got vicious. This email, I might have required reading for my students because it clearly is not private because they cc'd it to these 50 people of which I was on it and so forth, but it got personal. Really, were you on that? In, no, but sorry. maybe you heard about it. But anyway, evidence, and so that even this, uh, well, anyway, I won't go there. But here's the deal. And so that the, it even, it's just come out new scientists, and this is brand new. I don't even know if it's on the newsstands yet. But uh, there she is, okay? He says this is a single most important data point in the entire field of gerontology. Okay, maybe a little overstatement, but maybe not. It's kind of good. Uh, okay, so that now, here's the key. Which one is this old woman? Here's the daughter. Here's the daughter, Yvonne, and this is actually Jean Calmont, the mother. I mean, she looks young for a mother, uh, daughter, but anyway, there's the mother, there's the daughter, and so it's the uh, identity switch hypothesis is where we're headed here. And so you'd think that there'd be this face recognition software that would be able to sort this out for starters. But they're talking about exhuming the body and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, so here's the deal. So here's the original story. She's born in 1875, died in 19, 122 years plus change. And so that then and her daughter was born in 1898, died in 34 at age 36. Okay, so that this would be uh, 59 years and then 99 years. So that would be the new model. Okay, so the hypothesis. Yvonne assumed her mother Jean's, Jean's uh, identity when she died in 1934. So here's the original, is that this is uh, Jean. And then she died. And then she went on, Jean, you know, just uh, as the story, original story goes. Here's the switch hypothesis, is that at uh, 1934 uh, that Jean dies and that then they switch. And that is Yvonne says now she's Jean, okay? And then she goes on and the idea here would be that this would be fraudulent, okay? Now, you'd think, and so this is a big deal 
because they even have a monument, basically, you know, to John Clement in France and say the doyen of the world and uh, all that kind of stuff. So there's a vested interest in sticking with the original story. And I thought this Zach had a pretty good story. If you read it, this is an idea for reading in demography. <clears throat> a sign that is a reading for Zach's paper because he goes point by point and it's like, my goodness, this is really a fraud. But in fact, then a uh, 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 guy in uh, Denmark, not Denmark, but Netherlands, writes a paper that counters uh, almost, uh, have you seen that? I don't know, but he counters most of the, all the points basically. And it's like, yeah, for one thing, how do you switch, uh, what's a funeral about? It's like, there is a public funeral, you know, and so forth. But anyway, it's really interesting. So the idea would be students read Zach's and it's just convincing. Of course, this is a big fraud. And then you read the counter because, uh, but anyway, it's uh, make a great, uh, great project, okay? Now, there's other uh, um, controversies, that is trends in life, uh, maximum lifespan. I'll just say that's a controversy. I'm not going to go into the details here. And because there's the points. Where do you draw? This way, this way? Where do you go with that? Whether lifespan is maxed out, you know? That's the trends in maximum ages of death. I'll go through this fast. Okay? And another one is that whether this is leveling off or not. Okay? There's a huge... Uh, controversy now. We were the ones that found this in insects and nobody has challenged that. That set the stage. But then people said maybe it occurs in humans and so forth. But there's a lot of pushback on that for humans. They haven't seen it in rodents, for example, and the leveling off. And so uh, that's, that's the three controversies. The trend in the slope business, the trend in maximal age, and then the Madame Camont uh, controversy, okay. So that, uh, just to touch on my book here, this was coming out, uh, they say it's, it's for fall release, but um, it'll be uh, copyright 2020. But this will be the first book on biodemography. And uh, we, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, this is, a life, this is literally a life work for me. But it's with uh, Debbie Judge, Deborah Judge, who's a population biologist at the University of Virginia. And it's really packed full of, I think, really good information, interesting information. So you can go through all the chapters here. Kind of the meat and potatoes of demography, but we have new takes on a lot of this, applications. And we have a whole section here we call biodemographic shorts. And uh, these are little snippets, things that are really interesting, but don't fit neatly into, um, you know, one of the, one of the chapters. Uh, what's the population growth rate for a man to have two wives? Okay, a 40-year-old man to have two wives, okay? I had all that laid out here, but I don't have time to go through it, okay? And let me just say, call to action here. What do you take away from this? I think that for demography, that to uh, start to integrate some of the basic concepts here. It's like the tree of life, is that humans are one species, but you have no perspective, I'm not saying you as in, uh, but uh, no perspective. You need the perspective uh, more globally, just to be able to put humans into uh, a more global context. It's like knowing the distance to the moon, but not to the sun. You have no perspective, you know. And so that to be start working biodemography into classical demography would be, I think, uh, a good, uh, good thing. And conversely, ecologists and population biology, huge amount to learn from demography. This, the, you've been, demographer has been working on this for hundreds of years and really have it down, okay? There's others, uh, technical, this age business is a huge challenge, and then the evolutionary demography of humans, I think that there's uh, a lot of potential there. It's, we're working on it uh, as I speak right here, and I think that's it. So uh, thanks uh, for everybody. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, no, go ahead. I study inequality, so I study variance, uh -huh. and not central tendency. Mm -hmm. I see the variance in lifespan in humans as they age now widening out. That would give, is that no we don't, questions? We don't, which, which, what are you calling? Age specific girl mortality. Conditional and survivors. Conditional and survivors. Survivor. Survivor. Okay. Uh, does that happen in other species too? A, a widening variance? The first question. And the second question is. I'm not sure if I wrap my head around that first. Maybe we can come back to that. But we go ahead. What's your second question? Yeah. The variance is widening, isn't it? It seems to me that there's evidence that the very top end, the ones who are living longest, should be some evidence that lifespan will continue to. Well, you could say, just to say, uh, look, um, that, that's where I have lifespan here. It's, that's almost a whole nother talk. 
But <clears throat> um, let's just say intuitively first. Do you think for the next 100 years, 1,000 years, that that record would never be broken? Is that people will just say, you know, we've reached that. We're, we're, yeah, of course. And so just intuitively, uh, I can't uh, believe that there's some limit, and certainly that one in particular, okay? And so that there is a paper, just getting back to your first one, I get, maybe you need to clear, or I need to get it clear in my mind, the exact question. A new paper by Vapel, where the older ones are living longer, uh, so that they're the ones benefiting most. Um, but how, how did that go? It's something along that line, you know. Well, in economics, we know that actually economic well-being rises above age 90 because those who are survivor tend to be those with the highest yeah, income yeah. and yeah. so yeah. forth. But I, I'm just, the variance is troubling because of policy, trying to design social security policy when you know that some parts of the population will live five years, the other, others ineligible, they will live 15, yeah. 20 years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I was just wondering, is, is, is that in other species? You, you know, I mean, when you say other species, the, the only other data set we have that's really even comes close to what humans are about is this, uh, you know, our fruit fly data. And so that uh, you, when you're talking about even a few thousand, when you get to the older ages, you have a few score left at most. And so you really can't, I can't answer that question because I don't think the data are there. Uh, but it's a good question. Uh, but. Yeah, that's the best I can do for the moment, yeah. I have more slides here I could go back to, you know. Yeah, go ahead. You can talk a little bit more about this, this idea that you mentioned in the beginning about the, the co-evolution of uh, longevity and the, the social nature yeah. of, uh, uh, of humans in particular. Mm -hmm. So I think oftentimes, um, in informal demography at least, there is a great desire to see the, the biological underpinning of human life is fixed and then thinking about kind of sort of social variation around that. But you're making a very a very different kind of argument and treating with it we don't often mm -hmm. actually hear. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about ways in which you see the, the social life influencing. Well, what was it? I actually wrote a paper. Um, long, what did I call it? Longevity extension in humans is uh, self-reinforcing and um, <clears throat> in population development review. And the idea here is that you have, you got to start someplace and now we, when you're on the farm or whatever and you got to have 10 kids because you need a couple anyway or five or something to name a number to make it to adulthood to support you and so forth. And so you have a lot of kids in order to have a few, you know. But now you increase, uh, uh, but there's a cost there because even for women, I always use this, uh, this German expression, one tooth, one, uh, one kid, one tooth. And so that uh, every time you have a kid, you lose a tooth because of the uh, calcium uh, drain and all that stuff. But, but anyway, now you have 10 kids and, uh, uh, you know, there's costs beyond the tooth, obviously. But anyway, now you reduce, uh, sorry, you increase survival of the kids. And so now ki parents can depend on three to four making it to adulthood. And so that now uh, the, the parents... Uh, because her head, at least the uh, woman has less drain so that she's healthier, okay? So the healthier parents can raise healthier kids and then the healthy kids, how does this work anyway? Then they become healthy adults and healthy, anyway, it's a self-reinforcing concept where it's, it's uh, iterative, where the health uh, begets health on, on each generation. And so finally, and furthermore, I always say, uh, you know, 14 high school graduates don't equal one molecular biologist from the University of Wisconsin in the sense that I don't care how long the high school graduates study or, I mean, work on something molecular, they're not going to get there. You need, so in other words, if you have new regenerative medicine concepts and so forth, it takes that one kid, because now you're putting all the resources into a very small number of kids to uh, take them to a new level, which in some, you know, is going to circle back so that now you have uh, educated uh, children and workforce and all that business. So that's how that, uh, that's how I work that back in 
to uh, that. But I think coming back to this nest and hut business, uh, I'm really actually uh, really interested in this because I think that this nest as nexus concept really maps into human evolution and the social aspects and so forth in a really important way. I just haven't yet fleshed it out, but I see the potential there, yeah. No question, I'm gonna go back here. I gotta show you this. If you saw that in the New York Times, why do the oldest people keep dying? Okay, you didn't see that. <laughs> and, uh, but the, uh, okay, I'll back up there. The point being, these are the oldest person. So you have somebody old, 105, typically she, right? Holds reign as the oldest person in the world. And then uh, she dies. And so the next oldest comes up and has reign for a while. But the point is, in the New York Times, um, they talked about the interval. And so that you'd have an interval holding reign for seven years or whatever uh, back here. But now it's just you get the oldest person and then they die in the you know, shortening interval. This, uh, this actually is a queuing problem. And so that um, it's the, the thought uh, experiment was uh, the oldest person in a village becomes king. What's the probability of becoming king? You know, it's a non-trivial question. And um, uh, Rao, uh, Roland Rao, of, uh, yeah, he uh, presented a paper a year ago in the, the population meetings and uh, uh, found that it's really a queuing problem. You're queuing up for death, basically. But anyway, so there, there's one. These come out in these sh biodemographic shorts. There are a lot of, they're just some of them really interesting. But here's one, too, and that is that you have age pyramid for stationary population. Here is the distribution of men uh, for age, zero to 100 or whatever. This is a distribution for women, okay, for a stationary non-growing population. Here's the distribution if it grows. It looks smaller, but it's not, but it's flat, you know, this is different scale here. This is really a wide base because it's rapidly growing, a lot of babies. So the question is, how many, uh, what's the growth rate needed for a 40 year old, uh, all 40 year old men to have two 20 year old uh, wives, okay? And so here's the uh, issue, and that is with growth rate equals zero, is that you have roughly the same, there's a little bit of difference. A 40 year old, most people have survived both men and women, sort of differentiated is when they get older, okay? So you could only have one wife, um, men could only have one wife. You can cut the other way too, you can have women. But anyway, now when you have a growing population, uh, so this is 3%, and so now you'd have this fraction of, what is this, men, okay? And women down here 20 years, okay? So the age structure is skewed, so it turns out the answer to that question would be 3% uh, growth rate, and that there's a ratio of uh, two 20-year-old women for every one man. Last one, I'll close out. We go to, I teach in um, Uganda every year. <clears throat> Actually, what I teach is what I'm gonna talk about tomorrow. And uh, if you have time, come by. Yeah, I think you'll learn a lot about presentation and best practice and so forth. But in any case, um, we go, when I go there, then my wife and I go on every kind of tour you can imagine, you know, in Africa. Anybody wants to go to Africa, talk to, talk to me. But in any case, in Kruger, which is a uh, northern part of South Africa, they have a huge elephant problem. It's just destroying the whole park. It's overpopulated. And so you have three choices you have to control the population. One, uh, you actually, none of them are choices. Hobson's choice. But uh, one, you could airlift them out. No, you really can't. But anyway, let's say in principle you could. In other words, move them. Okay, let's try moving 5,000 elephants with these helicopters and so forth. Or, you know, it doesn't work. Uh, second would be sterilization, okay? Here's the problem with that is that it changes the matriarch and all of uh, females' behavior. So it's just hugely disruptive. And then your third one is culling. So now let's just kill thousands each, you know. You can't, the the uh, uh, public relations issue there is huge, but Every one of these, even if you could find one that kind of might work, is disruptive and, uh, to the elephants, and they can communicate over huge spaces, okay? And so that this one over, way over out there, 20, 30, 40 miles away, 
knows what's going on here because of these low rumblings that nobody can hear. And so it disrupts all the elephants in that park, and the very purpose is to attract people to watch the elephants and so forth. But here's the demography of it, and that is what the way I work this out. I have a section in there in harvesting in this uh, application, is that you start out with 15,000 elephants, which is where they are in Kruger right now, and let's say you had a 10-year program, that the first year you got to kill 2,000. Well, you've got to dispose of those, too. I guess they have rendering for dog food and that sort of thing, so you can kind of get through that, but that's a lot of elephants. And this is every stage. You don't just cherry-pick the old. You have to kill whole families, because if you cherry-pick the old, it disrupts everything. And so there it is, and you walk all the way through here, and you end up where uh, finally you're down to 7,500, but you're killing only 1,000 for that year, but that's still a huge number. Now you have maintenance because they're still growing and now you have this would be the uh, metrics on that and that is you want 7500 maintained but you have 525 being uh, produced every year 52 infants juveniles and adults you got to kill them all it's a public relations disaster and so it's a huge huge problem we're acute it's just they're just um, you know eating their uh, and uh, destroying basically the Kruger Park. It's a huge challenge for them. But anyway, there's the demographics. So I, I'm one minute over. Any other quick question here? Can you push them further out? No, they go to Mozambique and there's no place to push them to. That's a problem, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, okay, so if like me, you have many, many things to think about tonight. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Carrie, thanks for this. Uh, please join me in. Thank you.